they're using an angle cut French bread? Yes. Should I brush them with olive yeah, oil? Yeah, brush them with a little olive oh, okay. oil on both sides. They'll go in the oven. Oh, okay. Uh, about 375 degrees for, you know, three or four minutes, just so they're lightly browned. And then the morel, aren't, they, aren't they oh, beautiful right now? They're, they're perfect. They're, these are the really one of the, some of the first of the season. I'll put this They'll, in the oven. And you, okay. to have, tell how you clean them. That's, I think that's the biggest problem for most people is how to clean them. Okay. Well, as we know, mushrooms are mostly water, so uh, water and cellulose. So what you want to do is, uh, if on the outside you just brush them with a uh, paintbrush uh, or a light brush, yeah. um, trim off the very end if it's woody, and split them in half to make sure that there's no little creatures inside. Do you inside. wash them? I don't wash them. I just brush them with a paintbrush. Oh, okay. You know. So here um, we have a whole cup ready for yep, you. And we have some butter that's already melted. So we're going to add, let me put this up a little bit. So we're going to add the morels that we've cut in mm. half. With the shallots. So just like a, tea, a tablespoon of shallot? Yeah. So the season for these beautiful little gnome-like mushrooms is uh, April through June. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love finding things like that. I have a little patch of those in my woods, too. I'm not telling you where those are. Nope. <laughs> It's really special. We'll have to follow you now. Yeah. And, and just season it with a little black pepper and a pinch of salt. So they exude a little bit of moisture, don't they? A little bit. Um, you want them, you know, that's one of the great things about when you're buying morels, you want them to be um, not dried out, but you want them to be firm. Plump, okay. Uh, if they're too wet, then they, they also have a, uh, they get a bitter flavor and oh. they also uh, let out too much moisture. And then I like to deglaze it with cream sherry as opposed to some of the other wines. Mm. And the reason for it is that the cream sherry has a nice smokiness to it. Oh, you know, I, I, I have that. forgotten I about cream sherry. I used to drink this. I did. I, I thought it was so good. But, uh, what's, what's the famous one that... I guess it's this Harvey's. one. Yeah, Harvey's. Harvey's Bristol Cream. Bristol Cream. I forgot all about that. Mm. And then once it comes okay. down and you see it. Well, if you don't have morels, excuse me, if you don't have morels. You can use. Any wild uh, mushroom? Any wild mushroom. You could even uh, use some of the, the wood type cultivated mushrooms like shiitakes. Um, and we're just going to add just a little bit of cream. Uh, in oh, honor to of James Jim Beard. Beard. <laughs> so you called him Jim? Yes. And. Uh, and I, I remember meeting him and, uh, and talking to him. And he was such an enjoyable character, well, full of information and joviality, wasn't he? And, and, and the most generous, no, generous person with knowledge that you, I think you could ever meet. He, um, you know, he just, he just loved talking to people. He did. So we're going to switch over to here, which is the morels with a little bit of cream well that's put. been added to yes. them, which we're going to add just a little of this cream. Okay. And then to this, we're going to add the fava beans. So why do chefs love fava beans so much? Oh. It takes so much preparation. They're just tasty, right? Well, and we have people that do it for us. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid. If you see a fava bean in the store, it doesn't look anything like that because it's, in, it's encased in two skins. A two skins. A thick one and then a thinner, difficult one to remove, right? Okay, and then what was the, oh, that was the Oh, that ramps. was, I'm sorry, and we added oh, the, the ramp wild leaves. ramps, which have that wonderful sweet garlic flavor. Yes. And then what we're going to do okay. here is we have the finished product. Yep. Um, the toast, I just took it out We have the, the toasted yeah. crostinis, so we're going to put those down. We have the spoon. This just goes on here. Oh, so tasty. And, and a little bacon on top? Well, it depends. If I'm making it for my daughter, she's a, a new vegetarian, oh, so okay. we don't get bacon. I won't have any bacon on mine. But what is this cheese? This is a Vela Jack, which is this great cheese from the Sonoma Jack, um, oh. from the Vela Cheese Company. Oh, okay. And it's specially aged for about 18 months. Mm. Swiss chard has large green leaves, sometimes ribbed with red, sometimes with orange, yellow, rainbow chard it's called. 
very, very delicious summer vegetable. And combined with slow roasted caramelized tomatoes, feta cheese, and onion, Swiss chard makes a delicious filling for a frittata, which is one of my favorite brunch dishes, and I make frittatas over and over again. Let me show you how. Cherry tomatoes, make sure none of them are too soft. One teaspoon of fresh thyme leaves. Two cloves of garlic, smashed, just put those right in the dish. Salt and pepper. A little bit of brown sugar for caramelization. Just a half a teaspoon. And two tablespoons of olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Now these go right into a preheated 325 degree oven for about 40 minutes. And now you can heat your pan. This is a 12 inch non-stick frying pan and you need a lot of oil for a frittata. Soften the onions in about two tablespoons of oil and I'll probably add a few more. So heat the oil, slice your two big white onions, approximately a quarter of an inch thick. These can go right into your skillet. I like big chunks of onion in my frittata. You don't want to brown them. You want to soften them. Don't forget to sprinkle always with a little bit of salt and freshly ground black pepper. Looks like a lot of onions they cook down. Now the Swiss chard, the stem should be cut into about half inch pieces. And keep those a little bit separate. They're gonna go in first. And then the leaves themselves are just cut into about half inch pieces too. You can make spinach frittatas. You could do kale. But the Swiss chard has a, a very nice flavor all its own. And while these are cooking now, break your eggs. Now, are you ready? 18 eggs for this size pan. Oh, and I even have some guinea fowl eggs. Look at those. Very different from a chicken egg. See how pointed the guinea fowl egg is? Perfectly interchangeable with regular chicken eggs. So just whisk this up. But you don't want it too frothy. You want a fluffy, but not necessarily frothy omelet. For the fluffiest frittata, whisk together the egg mixture just before making the filling. You don't want your eggs sitting around. That looks good. So for this particular frittata, we don't want to really caramelize the onions. You could, but I like the little bit of crunch of the onion. And these are such sweet onions, they taste really good. Just cook like this. Now add your Swiss chard. First the stems, and let those cook for a minute or so. Now add your Swiss chard leaves. It's about six to eight ounces of Swiss chard, including the stems. So just let the leaves wilt a little bit. You don't have to cook them way, way down. There, that looks really pretty. And now all 18 eggs. You wanna set the eggs in the bottom of the pan. A little bit more salt. Altogether, you're gonna use less than a teaspoon of salt in this frittata and a little bit of freshly ground pepper. And you can take a rubber spatula just pull the edge of the frittata away from the pan so a little bit more of the egg goes down the sides. In Spain, where I learned these techniques, it was over a big wood fire in the yard of the hotel we were staying in. Oh, so delicious. That looks very, very good. Now, place your tomatoes right into the egg. These are the cooked tomatoes. You want these everywhere so that every slice will have some tomato in it. And the feta cheese. And I'm using about 3 quarters of a cup of feta cheese. Let that cook a little bit. Your oven is preheated to 425 degrees. And we're going to put this right in. That's going to take 15 to 20 minutes to cook. Yummy, yummy, yummy. That is a frittata colorful and extra tasty. Now, frittatas can be served hot, right out of the oven, warm, or at room temperature. A lot of people even like them cold. Now, take a sharp knife and cut into wedges and serve. Oh, doesn't that look really good? 
So you can serve this for breakfast, lunch, dinner, any time of day or night. Frittata will be welcome in your kitchen. so good. I'm standing here <laughs> smelling this fantastic lamb. Oh, now, what you. cut of the lamb is it that you're using? This is the shoulder. Uh, we're going to use a shoulder cut. Uh, still has some rib bones in there, which is yeah. great. It's yeah. the ideal cut for this. You know, there's yeah. plenty of substitutes. We could use right. uh, a piece of leg or, or even a shank, but uh, this yields really great results. And, and delicious. It's tender, isn't yeah. it? So this is the shoulder. Uh, and what we do is we're just going to add a little bit of paprika, fennel seed, and uh, nutmeg into some canola oil. Oh, okay. Yep. So I'll just put, pour that in for yeah. you. Now, um, what was your um, inspiration for this particular spring menu? Well, you know, lamb is, uh, everybody loves lamb. Uh, and I was just kind of looking for a little bit of a diverse uh, kind of uh, cut and uh, technique to... Do you serve it in the restaurant? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so so oh, this good. is, uh, we serve this in the restaurant. And, you know, lamb chops are, are lamb chops, but I wanted to do something a little more exciting, a little different. Uh, so we kind of incorporated this technique with this cut. So it's not a fatty cut, it's a very nice cut. Yeah, and, and you know, mm -hmm. it has a little bit of sinew and everything in there, yeah. and you know, it kind of yields a lot of good flavor. Yeah, very nice. So, so how long do you let it sit, sit like this? Just like that, it's okay. fine. We just want to quickly uh, marinate that. And basically we have a hot pan here. Okay. And what we do is, uh, I'm just going to take this. Yeah. And basically we want to sear it on all sides. Okay. Should I pour this on this side too? Yeah. yeah, don't waste this fabulous stuff. Okay. Yeah, so basically we'd just bring this in here and we'd sear it on all sides, which would bring us to this. I see, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so how long does that take, like no, 20 minutes or something? Yeah, it'll probably take like uh, 10 to 20 minutes, okay. depending on you know the size. Basically you can just put this, you're gonna use this pan for everything. You can keep reutilizing the pan so you kind of develop all the flavor in oh, the bottom. Okay. So uh, we're gonna remove this really quick. And instead of using like a rack or something like that, we're just gonna add all of our vegetable and aromatics. It's gonna add flavor, it's gonna caramelize some sugar, right. some carrots, onions, we have celery. celery. <gasps> Lots of red onions. So yeah. do you like red onions? I do, yeah. I do. I think that uh, they add a little bit more oniony flavor to everything. And uh, thyme too? Yeah, we have some thyme sprigs. And I'm gonna go with some beef stock here. We can use chicken stock, but beef stock's a little heartier. Uh, you know, lamb has a little more of a strong flavor. Now, I love the flavor of lamb in the springtime, and, and the way you mix it with all the vegetables, the fava beans and the onions and the ramps and all those things, spring yeah. onions, it's, a, it's really delicious. Well, it kind of stands up to everything. Yeah. You know, it's disgusting. And to... people like to have a rustic cut of meat, actually, I think. I do, personally. I yeah. think it usually yields more flavor. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can make this a day ahead of time, so, you know, you can prepare. It's uh, a little less stress, you know, if you're going to prepare this. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to kind of like the classical technique, we're going to lard this. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to make little incisions, uh, like two inches apart. So lard and, it, but not with lard. Right. Just larding, meaning we're going to insert some uh, flavor inside okay. the meat. And we have some rosemary. And I actually brought some spring garlic. Oh, uh, at home, you can replace that for uh, regular garlic. But you just kind of want to tuck them into the little incisions. And you don't have to do it. It doesn't have to be very uniform. But it looks pretty too. So we just kind of want to, we're going to lard that and uh, we're going to oh, add it back. Okay. Oh, right on top. Yeah, oh, right on good. top. Okay. And uh, we're going to bake this in an oven. We're going to bring this up. We're going to bake it in an oven. We're going to start out at 400 degrees. Uncovered? Uh, no, we oh, have covered. this wonderful. Oh. Martha wrap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You like it? This is great. <laughs> I love how it has the, the foil and the parchment built in. Because yeah. basically what we're going to do is we're going to, we put the, the, uh, the stock in there to kind of, it's going to evaporate. Okay. So the fat's going to drip out of the lamb, it's going to evaporate, it's going to create flavor, Excellent. moisture, vapors. Uh, so we're going to bake this in the oven for 400, we're going to turn it down to 300, and it's going to take three and a half to four hours. And we've got to let it rest for at least two hours. It's very, it's a crucial part oh, is to let oh, it rest to let oh, all the juices okay. recirculate. Okay, two yeah. hours, okay. Yeah. So you have to really plan your roasting time so that you don't have people sitting around for four hours <laughs> waiting for dinner. The which, trick to this is planning ahead. Yes. So uh, we we're going to add onions and fava beans and other nice spring-like additions. So, um, so yeah. What, so we're going to start with spring. I'm such a huge fan of onions. They oh. just they have so much flavor. And they, and they can develop so, so many good, yeah they? so many different elements of flavor. And uh, I think it's yeah that one. Some something over there is good. All right, <laughs> All right it's good. So basically we can take these, we can leave about an inch, inch and a half on the green, and we would just quarter those. It's always important to look for uh, a variety, some oh, red, yes. some cipollini, some spring onions. And while you're doing that, I'm going to peel some fava beans. I have a unique way of, of 
the way I like to peel them. Oh, yeah. Stuff them. <laughs> so you peel them raw. Yeah, I like to peel them raw, take okay. them out of the skin. You were having a big dispute <laughs> yesterday about this. <laughs> so yeah, you just want to kind of get in the little nook there. You just dig out the skin. Okay. And these are these are uh, an amazing bean. They taste so um, so delicious. But but it's not the whole bean that you eat. You only eat the inside of the green. So this this, this uh, casing goes away. And then where yeah. where's the little nook and cranny? The little nook right there. Oh, right there. Yeah, like the little. Okay, because we parboiled them and they seem to peel faster. But you don't like to do that. No, I, because it, you know the least cooking possible, the more okay. sweetness they retain. So okay, there. It's uh. Okay, maybe it is where the, that little nook and cranny is the secret. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so here's some onions. Yep, so we have the onions, so we have a nice hot pan, uh, a little bit of canola oil, and basically we kind of want to char and caramelize the onions. Okay. So. Now, do, you, do you have a wood-burning stove in your restaurant, or? We have, uh, no, we have uh, kind of like a hearth. Uh-huh. So you do actually want a hot pan. Okay. Like a smoking hot pan. The reason we use canola oil is because olive oil might burn. Oh, right. uh, and what we're kind of looking to do, we're, we're kind of looking to uh, get a nice hard caramelization, almost to the point of charring, uh, without really uh, kind of burning them. So kind of, this is like the oh, perfect. Yeah, look how beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the color, the flavor, you start to develop the sugar in there. And how long do they have to cook them? Because you really don't want them raw. Right. So we would caramelize them in here. It would probably take like uh, three to four minutes, maybe five minutes at most. Okay. Uh, we get some color. And we're gonna, we're gonna, the cooking really is gonna be done in the oven. So when they're at this stage, uh, we take a little bit of honey. Mm. I learned a trick today. Yes, isn't it great? <laughs> yeah. Um, and pretty much, we would just try to caramelize the honey, which would take like a minute or two. And then almost like a, a gastrique, we're gonna add some uh, acid to it. Mm. Gonna kinda make it like so what, sweet like and sour. A, a vinegar? Yeah, so that's okay. a little bit of champagne vinegar. Okay. Uh, we'll add our stock. So we're going to walk this to the oven, because this actually oh, okay. has to bake in the oven. Oh, okay. Yeah, for 10 to 20 minutes. Oh, and look at the look at those fantastic fava beans. Yeah. Oh. So take a nice hot pan again, uh, a little bit of shallots. We're going to caramelize the shallots really quickly, and we're going to add our fava beans. We want to get a little bit of color on there. Mm. So beautiful. Yeah. It's such a nice shape, too. Yes, a little bit of salt and pepper. I remember the first time I ate a fava bean was in England at the River Cafe. Oh, wow. Oh, and that's they a made a, they made, fava bean. They made a whole bean pea salad, which was so amazing. Oh, this is beautiful. So we're looking for a little caramelization, kind of like we have here. Okay. Uh, we had some sun-dried tomatoes that have been hydrated. And kind of just a little bit of sweetness. Fava beans can kind of be very earthy and... Oh, uh, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, they can be sweet as well. And essentially, we add our onions. These are our cooked onions. We add them back in. With all the juices, right? Yeah. And a little bit of some mint, some fresh chopped mint, lamb and mint. Mm. We're not doing the old mint jelly, so we're going to yeah. incorporate the mint this way. And that's pretty much it. That's that's our uh, father bean and roasted so onion salad. Gorgeous, beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So here's our lamb, our finished product. See now, it looks different <laughs> than a leg of lamb, <laughs> and uh, has all these bones. Yeah. Yeah. But so succulent, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of falling off the bone. Uh, kind of remove this bone right here. You see it'll peel right, right. away, and you see all the juice kind of. That's the shoulder blade. Yeah. Mm, so juicy and so delicious. It's so where all the flavor is. that's been sitting for two hours. Yeah. Okay. And look, it comes off. When it's well cooked, it comes right out, right? Yeah. Look at that. So we will, uh, you know what we'll do? Do you want to put a little bit of our... Veggies, uh, yes. Yeah, veggies right on there. And instead of uh, like slicing this, because it's kind of like a braised, slow roast, uh, we're just going to cut off a nice large piece. You can see the color. Like, it's like a lamb pot mm -hmm. roast almost. A nice, oh, wow. delicious color right there. And uh, a little sauce. Yeah, a little bit of the, this is the natural jus left in the pan afterwards. Mm. First, come up with this idea for the potato uh, for the asparagus flan. Well, basically, uh, asparagus is the, one of the very first vegetables coming out of the ground, so yes. automatically. And then asparagus. Somebody asked me to do uh, an appetizer, but without flowers, and so I was thinking about a tart or so on, so on. 
why not doing the flan from the asparagus right. in a in a so in a glass like a little custard exactly a, asparagus custard, custard with asparagus on top on a uh, small little poached uh, quail eggs on top of it right and Pierre is uh, just a genius at making the small individual uh, hors d'oeuvre which are quite filling and if you eat six or eight of Pierre's uh, hors d'oeuvres you've oh, really yeah, had it's dinner a meal, definitely. yeah yeah and uh, so what else would you suggest uh, serving for a great outdoor party? Well, basically, you can do, uh, I like to do a bean salad as well on a croutons or whatever you can prepare in advance as well because right. you don't want uh, spending your time in the uh, kitchen, in the kitchen right. once you have a party outside. Right. So it's all little or chicken, chicken with a plenty of herb salad and everything served on croutons or things that you can eat. Basically, it's hand right. food. And yours are, are generous size without being too big. They're all bite size. They're bite size. And yep. they are utterly delicious. Mm. And uh, Pierre um, uh, collaborated with me on my new entertaining book, which is coming out in November, November 1st. Uh, you're all going to just oh, be so excited when you see this book. Aren't you going to be excited? Definitely. I can't I'm wait. very excited. Definitely. It's like me having another baby. <laughs> it's really an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And your recipes and, and all the food that you helped me prepare, just so beautiful, Pierre. Thank you so much. So um, is there anything you should avoid making for an outdoor but, party? Uh, avoiding as well is definitely uh, things who don't, can stand too long outside, neither of warm food or food right. who deprive fast. So right. basically, you have food who after a couple of meals, they fade it, who don't look that nice. So... Uh, do you know, it's, very, it's mostly food you can stand, uh, stand outside a little, while. A little right, while, exactly. Right. Not in the bright sun, though. Definitely I not. wouldn't put mm -hmm. any, any food in the bright sun. I just, I'm always moving uh, umbrellas around From people's tables. tables. So let's get started with the flan. So we go to do the flan. So basically, we have a bunch of asparagus. It's approximately 16 asparagus in a bunch like that. Okay. They are medium size. We're going to cut them in three uh, different. Uh, so we're going to have the head of the asparagus. The Down tip. here, the tips, the tip. yep. That's the go we're going to decorate with, uh, with those. Then we're going comes from Alsace. Yep. And we have plenty of beautiful asparagus. What do you call the tip of the asparagus uh, in Alsace? Pointe d'asperge. Oh, point. so it is. It's yep. a point. Uh, point, asparagus exactly. Yeah. So the middle part, I would say something like the two inch, uh, uh, two and a half inch of the middle of the asparagus, right. nine screen part, we're going to save them and cut them in small little pieces. The end part, we're going to just chop them in uh, big pieces, something look like a half an inch. Uh, and we're going to do the flan with the door spa. Oh, okay. The very end so the, part. You make, you're, going to, you're going to puree that. Exactly. Okay. We're going to... But uh, only the green parts. Uh, exactly. The, unless they're white asparagus, then you could do all white. But, you can do it with all white as well. Down exactly. the bottom. And, yeah, the tough part, basically, this part, you eliminate it. And you have approximately yeah. this one. So if you need a bit more, you need approximately a cup of, of uh, this one. Okay. We have less on the salad. So, so we're going, just going to pour in, them in olive oil. In olive oil. Okay. Nice and warm. So we're just going to sear them. With a little salt and pepper? And salt, yeah. We're just going to sear them, basically, okay. and give them a nice coloration. Okay. Once it's, uh, it's, so these uh, are done. it's done, those are already done. So that's taking approximately, I would say, uh, they're cooked like that. But we're going, to add, we're going to add a cup of water to help them uh, oh, okay. boil as well. And once this one is done, after two minutes, that's approximately the result. You have, you're going to have cooked asparagus okay. with a tiny little bit of uh, liquid uh, remaining on the bottom. So what we're going to do now is the flan. We're just going to add a half a cup of milk. Oh, and a half a cup of heavy cream. A half a cup of heavy cream. And then we're going to add a whole cup of uh, spinach or parsley. But spinach is oh, better. Yeah. It's mostly for the color as well. It's going to help the flan to stay nice beautifully on green. So we're going to cook so that for... Real, just the leaves, pretty much, right? Exactly, yeah. okay. exactly. So we're just going to cook that for approximately three minutes, and then we're going to chill it down on ice. Okay. So, so that's easy enough. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to show you how we cook the vegetables here. Uh, so we're just going to cut these asparagus lengthwise. Okay, I can do that. And so we're on. just going to do tiny little dice like that. Oh, and where does that go? And that's going to be... Oh, in the custard? It's, it's going to be on top of the custard. Oh, okay. So we're going to have the asparagus tips that we're going to blanch oh, okay. later on. And we're going to have the little pieces okay. here as well. Oh, pretty. That's the result, basically, of... Uh, Should I just do that to the rest? Yep, yeah, but okay. just here we have the, the, the flan who has been cooled down. We're yeah. just going to uh, put it nice and smooth. So it's going to be nice and smooth. And we're going to add two eggs, two whole eggs, and one egg yolk. So you're making a custard. Flan is either a filling for like a quiche, or exactly. it is a custard for creme caramel, or 
uh, creme caramel, yeah. creme brulee. Right, those are but all the, flan the, too. The, 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 the nice part of it is that you could use this flan in a tart shell as well. You don't have to do it in a in a. Yeah, we can make a quiche a out of this, right? You can do a quiche out of this one as or well. Or little tarts. With a little tart. Mm. On the, then here we do it with spinach, but you can do it with uh, with this. Uh, we can do it with uh, carrots, with uh, broccoli, with any vegetables you want, basically. Awesome. So we're just going to add the eggs uh, down here okay. and smooth this nice uh, green custard again. Just go to. are so good. Don't you love that? Oh, it's great. Beautiful so that's a Vitamix. great Vitamix. Yeah. Vitamix is definitely, and it's going to smooth, to have a nice, very nice smooth puree. So what we're going to do now is we're going to fill up this little, that's okay, great. So there I got all these We're going these to cut. fill up all this little glass jar. Mm. Uh, it I would smells so good when it's it. cooking too. Really delicious. And automatically it needs a bit more salt. We have to rectify the seasoning as well, so you can always taste that and see if it needs more salt okay. and pepper. And those we're going to blanch them later. Oh, uh, they, on get the, blanched. Yeah, they get oh. blanched, yeah. Oh, okay. So basically this one, I'm going to fill that. And meanwhile, if you want, you, you can put a little bit of water on the bottom of the, of the dish. So you're making a little bain marie. Exactly. And a little hot water bath. bath. Exactly. And we're going to bake those in the oven. So Pierre, uh, when he comes to my house, he goes to my wonderful um, pantry in the basement where I keep all my dishes and, uh, uh oh, yep. we spilled a little there, okay. Um, and finds all the little things that, that uh, make such beautiful, you could even put that in a smaller pourer and just pour yeah, it and in. Yeah, pour them in, it okay. works, works as well. So this okay. one, we're going to bake them. So preheat your oven, th what, 375? 375, okay. and it takes you approximately 18 to 20 minutes to, to bake. Okay, great. We're back with Pierre Shedlin, who uses uh, tiny quail's eggs, these beautiful little quail's eggs, uh, for inventive garnishes. And uh, for this aspar uh, asparagus flan, they look so pretty on the they top. They do. Poached, though. So, want to show how to poach? Yep, definitely. Oh, yeah. This is Pierre's way. Uh, rather than doing them individually and painstakingly, watch this. So, so basically, what you're going to do, I'm just going to just to show how to open a quail egg, because yeah. a quail egg is not a... Uh, you shouldn't crack it, right? Uh, yeah, you cannot crack it, because the uh, inside is kind of a little bit stronger than a regular egg. So, basically, what I like to do, I just put a... So you knife like that, and you play like, uh, oh, okay. and it works quite well. So okay. and it's much. So you do that. That's mostly in a restaurant. If not, you can always play with a little knife and serve so it as well. Put them all into a bowl like that, like with that. the whites, just the like whites, that. Like that, 16 together. And the way we're going to do it here, we have the, some boiling water with some vinegar. White vinegar. The white vinegar, exactly. And then we're just going to give a kind of a wave to the other, and we're just going to pour all Look, the all the, of the them at once. Uh, at once. Now this is like magic. And basically, they all separate very easily, and then we go yeah. to let them cook for a minute and a half. Okay, and you Ta take away all that? That's and all excess? That's all we, the excess. We're going to uh, clean them once they're in the cold water. It's much okay. easier to, to walk them. So, so we're going to I let them, yeah, that, exactly. I and meanwhile, we're just going to blanch the, the asparagus tips. So it's a salt, uh, water, we salt okay. it. We're going to add the, the, uh, the asparagus tips and let them boil for two minutes, and we're going to do exactly the same thing once those are cooked with the, the, the okay. asparagus that you touched. For how long? This one for two minutes and this right. one for two minutes as well. Perhaps okay. a little bit less. I know you want them yeah, uh, uh, yeah. not to overcook. Up so plan. a minute and a half, nice, yeah. nice and crisp. You can cook those perhaps a little bit longer. Look, they're all cooking. So they're all cooking nice so you and want separate. This, you want the yolks to be soft in the middle. Exactly. So okay. that's why a minute and a half so is just perfect. You can do big eggs like this too, um, the same method, but in a bigger pot. In a bigger pot. Deep or deep pot, right? Deep pot, deep. exactly. What you want is enough water. Uh, so um, you want a little bit of movement as well that you give with the... So they, uh, the water is going to separate the egg uh, yeah. uh, automatically I'd say as well. I this is done, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, once they're nice and soft, they put. Yep, yep, yep. they are done. Once those are done, okay. so now straight so get away. Get into the cold ice water. water. Exactly. Ice water is cold. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say cold ice water, right? No. Oh, and look, they're so cute. And so some of the uh, white goes away. You're going to trim. Exactly. You're going to trim. Then we're going to trim them uh, yeah. later on by okay. taking them individually by hand and yeah. moving the excess white to Lovely. separate. Okay. Um, once we are there, there, we have some asparagus who are cooked on here. So that's going to, and we, that's the one who are cooked. We're just going to cut them into lengthwise. So we can, like that. Yeah. And we have them all ready. And we're going to, now that we have these both uh, 
asparagus already uh, cooked, we're just going to season them with a little bit of salt. And I must tell you that when you pick asparagus from your own garden like I do, uh, they cook in even like half uh, the time. Uh, uh, half the time, right. absolutely. Right. longer the vegetable stays, more it lose water and then automatically right. longer it takes, it takes to, to, to cook. cook. So okay. we're just going to season a uh, very simple each of these asparagus just with a bit a drip of a uh, very nice olive oil and a little bit of vinegar. So just what a, kind of vinegar? Uh, that's a sherry vinegar. Okay. But you can use a red wine vinegar or any vinegar you basically like, just a tiny little bit. And here we go. We're just going to season both of the uh, vegetables and, and salt and pepper, exactly. Pierre's vegetables are always ultra delicious because he takes the time to season each one mm. separately, individually, and uh, and it's, it's good. Yeah, so, so here's our flan. So here's our flan, exactly, who came out as well. So here, so here the, 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 the asparagus that uh, the part the eggs that we clean, so you just take them out. Do you like clean that. them even more with scissors? Or you can not? clean them with scissors, exactly, yeah, and just, have them nice and thin. I, just take I do it by hand. Little skimmy, and skimmy. All the skimmy, exactly. And then we need. And then we're just going to drop them down here. Do you have them nice and okay. Down here. Yeah, you don't want any of these little drippy exactly. things. Exactly. So basically, once we are here. We have this flour which just came out of the oven. You want to let them set for, let's say, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to just get to room temperature. Or you could serve them cold as well, mm -hmm. or just as well. Now we're just going to decorate uh, this uh, little flour with some of these asparagus salad on top. See how pretty these are? And then you must have little spoons. You can use little bone spoons or um, even the little, um, uh, I, I love to use those mother of pearl spoons too. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. it work perfectly for that. You put the little eggs each time like a little nest in the okay, middle, so cut and it. you can cut them as well. So the, the nice uh, old yellow part oh, is coming yeah, nice and pretty. Nice. Oh, gorgeous. And we're just going to play afterwards with this little asparagus, like that. <laughs> and we just have. Let me cut that one. Exactly. Oops. Mm -hmm. There. So the color comes nice and ah. So beautiful. And there we go. So here you have the so asparagus have the, flan, which mm -hmm. are perfect. And what a great first course this is, too, for a, a luncheon. You could do um, double um, the amount in a slightly larger Oh, you can do it as a one or, or, or even serve it as an appetizer right. in a bigger board right. and eventually put a, uh, a chicken egg and put more we're asparagus. Having dinner, we're having dinner for my friends from Thailand. And that, and that, They're going to have this. Definitely could be okay. a good, uh, <laughs> definitely good idea. It's Thanks, on. Thank you. with Joey Campanero of the newly opened Kenmare restaurant where they have a wonderful salad on the menu made with artichokes and hearts of palm. My daughter ordered it. I ordered it. We loved it. So uh, Joey has agreed to show us how he makes it. Now this has um, both uh, raw and fried artichoke slices. Exactly. I, want, I really wanted to emphasize the difference in textures and raw artichokes have this texture that is just a bit resilient and once, once you break right through it, um, it, it's, uh, I think it's a very unique texture for a salad. And to add crunch to it, we also fry the artichokes. Look at this. And Joey's going to be making this salad for the christening of his new nephew. Michael, yes. Michael, and he's the godfather. So <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about your menu at, at Kenmare while you, while you prepare your artichoke well, there. I always try to let the season dictate the menu and always want to offer seasonal vegetables and 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 seasonal fish so you're trimming uh, the stem you're trimming the the, uh, the whole bottom of the artichoke well the right. outer the outer green. Uh, dark green parts what do you think of the artichokes this season they seem very nice um, I think this this is a great season for this great year for artichokes yeah how are yours doing at your home well there's still tiny little plants so the next the last year we had a great crop and mm. this year I expect even better ones because the Weather's already so warm, you know, it's gonna, they're going to grow like crazy. When I cooked in California, I always dealt with artichokes. And, you know, people in the kitchen are so competitive. So we used to actually race to see who could, who could clean the artichokes the oh, fastest. fastest. Oh, you're doing I a was, good job. I was never a winner in that category. Oh, you're doing a good job. <laughs> but you see how, um, how a chef does trim an artichoke? This is quite impressive. And, uh, and you wonder, what happens to the rest of it? What does happen? Well, usually artichokes can be cooked cooked whole, yeah. and then this is the edible part. Yeah. That's what my grandmother and my mother always used to yeah. used to serve for lunch, but and and this part is the stuff that made artichokes. So you don't want to eat that one. <laughs> so we take the a spoon. core. We take a spoon, or you can you know use the, the knife yeah. and, and and cut, cut that, that out. out. Right. 
and I just try and keep the knife um, in one spot and, and turn the vegetable. And that's a good, that's a good chip. It's a likely, less likely chance to get cut. So that's all the stuff okay. that made artichokes. So we want to get rid of that. <laughs> and now the oil is olive oil. This is a, um, um, a canola oil, which gets, oh. which, um, which also has a higher smoke point, and it's, and it's um, a little bit less expensive than grapeseed oil. Oh, okay. Uh, you can use and vegetable you want it oil at what for time? this. You want it about 360, or no, it's about three. Uh, no, it's I a like little, to fry. I like to hundred actually. Oh well, yeah, I like to fry um, artichokes or, or at a at a lower temperature, like three, oh, okay. three fifty, three hundred. Okay. And then what I have here is this mandolin, and we slice the artichoke. Oh, so that's going to be in the salad. This is going to be in the salad. Oh, look how beautiful. And then once we get to. Now, where are you getting your hearts of palm from? These uh, hearts of palm I, I, I get from uh, my, my produce purveyor. It's called Baldor. They deliver to a lot of, a lot of restaurants in the city and, and also in, in Boston as well. So those round parts is where you're going to fry. Right. And so we get to these sides, and then, mm -hmm. and then we save some of the artichokes in, for the salad, and then the rest get into the fryer, and this goes quick, and then, you know, there's always continual cooking process, so we'll take them out right before that they're, right before they're golden brown, and then once the oil drains off, um, they'll get, they'll get crispier. Okay. And so we are almost there. Yeah. And while those are going, I'm going to continue with the salad, which is hearts of palm. Now, hearts of palm usually come from the uh, peach palm tree in um, Costa Rica oh, okay. and South America. But these are farmed. These are not the wild. Exactly. Okay. Oh, look how pretty this is. And they, and they, and they firm up, right? They firm as the oil yeah. drains. Huh. And then always season. With a little salt, right? While exactly. they're hot still? Exactly. Yeah. So the salt sticks. Yep. And then in the salad, I add some picked parsley leaves. And this is flat leaf parsley or Italian parsley. We'll put all of them in there. Butter lettuce. Right. Butter lettuce. And then also we have... This is lemon juice and extra virgin olive oil, salt. So simple. It's a very, very simple salad. And I really wanted to use uh, the bib lettuce because it's a very neutral flavor. And so you can really taste the artichokes and but the hearts everybody palm. loves bib lettuce anyway. You know, they just love it. Yeah, I don't know anyone who so. doesn't like bib lettuce. Um, there we go. So we lightly okay. dress it there. And then... You so really pretty. want to get the... So the lemon juice keeps the artichoke from browning. Exactly. When, yeah. when uh, certain vegetables hit the... When they hit oxygen, they begin to oxidize. Right. And they turn brown like apples do it and... Pears. Exactly. Yep. Artichokes. And then with this... Is this yeah. one serving or two? That's two servings. Okay. But I know you like this salad, so we can make That's a big That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> And then I garnish so it with beautiful. the fried artichokes. Oh, yes. So, oh, look how pretty. Oh, so you have big rings and you have more frizzled. Right. How about the frizzles? We'll use the ones you made. They look yeah. good. And so you really have different Isn't texture in the salad. That is what you want to serve your guests or your family. That is beautiful. For more of Joey's fabulous food, I um, suggest that you check out Ken there. Or, of course, the little owl or market table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. When cooking with radishes, did you know that you can use not only the beautiful radish, but you can also use the radish greens? These are very similar to mustard greens, and the radish greens have a tangy flavor that combines very well with potatoes. And I'm going to show you today how to make a very delicious radish greens soup. And I'm just cutting off the greens right at the top of the radish. We'll use the radishes in something else later on. But these greens, which should be unblemished, they shouldn't be brown, they should be nice and fresh and green and crispy. These are going to now be washed. They'll give the soup a kind of pale green color. And you can just coarsely chop the greens, get some cooking well and in a big <laughs> stock pot add four tablespoons of unsalted butter and we've peeled and chopped 
one large white onion. And you don't have to cut it too finely. A quarter inch dice is fine. We want to kind of sweat the onions. Many soups are started this way. It's very nice to really cook the onions down just a little bit. Get out any harsh flavor. Have ready about one quart of really good chicken stock. So there, the onions are just turning translucent and we want them like that. And now add your radish greens. And these are the radish greens from about two bunches. Cook this until it's wilted. And I have the potatoes already. They're six medium potatoes. These are the baking potatoes. And they cook very nicely in soups. And there's six of them. And I've peeled them, washed them, and I'm cutting them up into about a half inch dice. Add to your pot. You can stir these around with the onions and the radish greens just until they're warm. And you can add your chicken stock. Four and a half cups. You can add a little bit of salt and a little bit of freshly ground pepper too. Bring it to a boil, turn it down, simmer it until the potatoes are really tender, about 35 minutes. We have one already cooked here, and it does smell very, very good. You can see that the greens have turned a dark green. The potatoes are tender. I'll just poke it with a knife so that you can see. Just very, very tender. And they're ready now to put through a food mill. I want to show you in two steps how to make a very, very fine soup. This is the way the French chefs do it. They will pour their soup first into a food mill and run it through. This is a great tool to have in the kitchen. Fit the mill with a fine sieve, not ultra fine, because you want to get through as much as you can. Well, we're done, I think. Scrape the bottom of the food mill. So you can see you can serve this as a wonderful vegetable if you like, or just enrich it with a little bit of heavy cream or half and half. But these pureed soups taste much better with a little bit of heavy cream. So I'm going to add a half a cup of heavy cream. And if you find that it's still a little bit too thick for your taste, thin it out with just a little bit more of your chicken stock. This looks like a nice consistency. Now, you can heat this up, serve it just like this, or put it through the very fine cone-shaped chinois. You can use a rubber scraper or a wooden spoon that helps push, but this is coming out, oh, very beautifully. Look how nice and very silken the resulting soup is. And while I wait for it to warm, I'm going to create my garnish. I already have picked some chervil leaves from the stem. You could use chopped parsley or even basil if you like. And I have my radishes here and I'm going to grate my radishes, making sure that I get lots of the red skin. And this will be beautiful topping the soup. It smells very good. Make sure you make lots of grated radish. And now before you put your simmering soup into the terrine, warm the terrine. It's just a nice little thing that I always make sure I do so that the soup stays piping hot. Just fill your terrine with boiling water. Cover the terrine if you like. Let it sit for a few minutes. Dump out the hot water and pour the beautiful simmering soup into the terrine. And take it to the table. 
So then when you lift off the top of your tureen, not only does the aroma come out, but a beautiful cloud of steam. And most delicate and flavorful radish green soup. Sprinkle a few chervil leaves here and there. And a little sprinkling of radish. And you have a beautiful, flavorful, delicate, unusual radish green soup. Next I'm gonna show you two more very simple radish recipes. Into some salted water, put one pound of linguine. I like dried linguine, this wonderful De Checo's great. A nice imported pasta. And for springtime, I can't think of anything better than making spring vegetable linguine with fresh peas and fava beans, all the things that are really good in the early spring garden. And this one's enhanced with fresh ricotta cheese and some shavings of Parmesan. It is a really good pasta, and if you got it in any restaurant, you would be thrilled. So why not make it for your family? It's really good. Now you're gonna blanch in some salted water about one cup of fresh peas. This is one pound of fresh peas shelled, and it comes out to about a cup. And I always put, oh, about less than a teaspoon, maybe a half a teaspoon of sugar in the pea water. It just does something to the flavor. We've already cooked our fava beans. Fava beans are a shell bean. Let me show you what they look like. This is what they look like when they're really nice at the grocery store. If you see these big beans, they look, oh gosh, what are you gonna do with these? Well, when you open these up, and it's kind of fun, everybody was in the kitchen shelling the beans yesterday. You shell them like this. They have a hard shell, kind of tough shell, and you parboil them, and when you finish parboiling them, they look like this. These are still not peeled. Then you slip off the skins. Inside is a shiny, dark green, tender bean. These are delicious. The peas are almost done. I think that's... They're tasty, they're al dente. I can just add them to the fava beans. Now we're going to start mixing in this bowl our one cup of ricotta cheese. Try to get ricotta cheese that is freshly made. If you're on a diet, you can get the reduced fat ricotta, but the whole, is, whole milk is really tasty. And you want a half a cup of grated Parmesan cheese. Mix this together. If you find that this is a little bit thick, you might want to add just a little bit, and I think this is a little bit thick. I'm gonna add some salt and pepper, but you can add a little bit of the pasta cooking water to your cheese. I'm just gonna dip in here and just get a little bit. Start with a little. You can always add a little bit more. That's better, better consistency. And then, of course, you can um, add some freshly chopped mint. I like to use just the leaves, about a quarter of a cup. Very tender and nice. You should always have some sort of controlled area in your yard where you grow yourself a bed of spearmint and a bed of mint. I must say, with the fresh springy taste of the peas and the fava beans, really, really good. And here is our mint that looks like about a quarter of a cup. Stir that in. Mmm, lovely. Now we're going to drain our pasta. We don't want to overdo this linguine. Well, I think we can drain it. When you're draining pasta, by the way, I don't know if you do this, but run the cold water in your sink. It'll cool off the drain as you're adding this very hot boiling water. Plus, it will prevent you from getting a steam burn. Now, I never rinse my pasta after I cook it like this. I don't want to cool it off. So I just like to shake it dry. 
see how pretty it looks? Really a beautiful variety, this linguine. Add this to your bowl. You really want every bit of pasta to be separate. And now just sprinkle it with a little bit of olive oil. About one or two tablespoons will do. You can now add your ricotta mixture. And add your peas. And you're going to want to add a little bit more Parmesan cheese in the shape of curls or strips for additional flavor. But if your cheese is well flavored, peas and beans well cooked, you will certainly have a delectable pasta. I like to serve it from a big platter like this and a couple curls of Parmesan cheese. And you can do this right at the table too if someone wants a little bit of extra cheese. You just use a little vegetable peeler like that. And what I like to do too is a few pieces of mint. So everybody knows that there's mint in there. And there you have a springtime pasta, a garden linguine that may just become one of your springtime favorites. I think it will if you try it. So what do you start with rhubarb? We're gonna cook our rhubarb first and foremost. Uh, we're gonna add a quarter cup of sugar. Okay. And then we're gonna add just a little bit of water just to moisten the whole mixture, just to get it started on the stove. Okay. And we're gonna add one teaspoon of lemon juice. And we're just gonna cook this until it softens, basically. And it takes about five to seven minutes. Um, and you really we're just want to take the rhubarb down to the point where it's it's just complete mush. Because, so like this. Exactly. Because okay. what we're going to do now is we're going to um, we're going to go ahead and put it in the okay. in the blender right, right here. here so. Thank you. And then you have to start heating the cream too, right? Yes. And and we always like to cook our fruit whenever we're making a fruit based ice cream. We always like to cook the fruit down. Um, to get rid of some of that water content. Right. Even though we started with a little bit of water just to moisten it, that'll cook out really quickly. And then that'll reduce the water in the ice cream and it'll make a creamier ice okay. cream. Okay. And then after that's blended up, we would just put that in the um, in a container and chill it down in the fridge. Okay. We're going to um, heat up uh, one and three quarters cup of heavy cream. Okay. And then we're going to add three quarters cup of milk. And in this recipe, we're actually using half a cup of honey. Um, we don't always use honey in our ice cream recipes, but I felt like this was a really nice combination of honey and rhubarb. And um, we actually, uh, I think there's a picture somewhere of uh, the hives that we have on our, our rooftop at oh, Byright look. Market. Oh. Uh, yeah. Right in San Francisco? Right in the middle of the city. Don't it's you pretty love cool. that? Yeah, oh, it's, it's so it's great. Neat. And we start out with two hives. Is this your honey that you brought? Um, it isn't. I, sh I should have thought to have brought it. You should have. Oh. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll send some along. And then we're going to add Oh, no, a I did. I did. Oh, you already added it. I'm sorry. I added the salt. So basically, we're going to bring that to a simmer. Um, and then we already have a simmer going yes. right back here. And we're going to bring this over. Should I put it on the pad? Um, oh, and scoop it in? Yeah, okay. and we're just gonna, what we're gonna do now is what uh, we call tempering our eggs. Okay, you can whisk and I'll pour. Yeah, and so I've got five egg yolks right here, and we're what we're doing is we're slowly raising the temperature of the egg yolks so that we don't curdle them when we cook them over the right. stove. So we're just bringing up that temperature just a little bit at a time, and then that's probably good, and then what we can do is we'll just put this back onto the stove. Thank you. Oh, and cook it until and it's then, a custard. Yeah, we would cook it until it's a custard. And what you're looking for when you're cooking a custard is you want this to be thick enough for it to coat the back of this uh, spatula. Right, and we have that here. Yeah, and that's and the you think people one. really understand what that is? So when you do this, you just take your finger and that does not close up. That's, exactly. That's what they're a, talking a clear about. clear path. Yes, yep. okay. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is, um, we would have gotten two cups of rhubarb puree from this amount. We're gonna use one and a half cups 
um, to add to our actual ice cream base, and then we're going to save that last half cup as a swirl at the very end. Oh, okay, so this one looks like it's ready for the yeah. swirl. Yeah, exactly. So, so how long did it take to freeze? Um, you know, it, it usually takes about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes on a tabletop machine. Um, oh, look how good. Can we put that in there? Um, we, what we're going to do is we're going to put this in our chilled container, oh, okay. and then we'll swirl it in. Oh, okay. So just take this. Yeah, we're just going to put that in there. And after so you put all the ice you, cream in, then we'll so do So what do swirl. you freeze your ice cream in? What's What shape? In what shape? Yeah. Um, well, we, we serve when our When you ice make cream. it at home like this, do you usually put it in a in a loaf pan like this? Um, yeah, that or easy a scooping. quart container from the, you know, okay. I, get, I have access to a lot of quart and pint containers at the creamery, so okay, I can use so those. But so, that's a great shape. It's so, nice and easy and to scoop. And then add a little bit of your rhubarb. Right. Oh, I just, love it. And then swirl that in, and that just gives a nice reinforcement of the flavor. Yep, and keep stacking yep. it up. Exactly, exactly. Oh, so beautiful. And yep. here we have one that's all ready to scoop. Right, for our Martha Sunday. Um, and so we're this gonna... is fun too to have the right ice cream scoop. And this one, you know, do you know that that your hand actually warms it? This is the scoop that we use at the creamery, oh, you actually. Do. Yeah, oh. and I and I believe that everybody's getting one of these. They today. are. Yeah. Everyone is getting a beautiful scoop. Perfect. And then, oh, it looks so pretty with that yeah. swirl. Isn't that nice? I like yes. that. That reinforcement. And so, and then, and then we're just going to do some strawberries on top. And then um, we just toss the strawberries with a little bit of honey. Mm. Um, and then I like to leave that at room temperature just to really uh, bring out the juices and it, it just adds so much Are flavor. Are strawberries ripening in California yet? They're starting, just oh, starting. And then we're gonna do um, some whipped cream and we've added a little bit of um, vanilla bean to this. Yes, how pretty. Which is really nice. Mm, and I have to taste this. And, and this, like is the Sunday. Sunday. this is the Martha Sunday. This is the Martha Sunday we're gonna. You, if you go to buy right, do they, do they get a discount? <laughs> we didn't think of that. <laughs> well, you can raise the price and then give them a discount. There you go. That's there you go. Mm, is this good?